welcome to everybody. Um, this is the second of our series of six seminars for this autumn. Um, and uh, this seminar now has extra impetus because of last week's announcement by the government of the Netherlands that they are reimposing many restrictions that they relaxed in uh, June, I think it was. Uh, and that has demonstrated, I think, to everybody that this, the, the, there will be no quick exit from this problem. Um, if you look at the debate about when a vaccine will be ready and then how long it will take for governments to inoculate, to, to vaccinate large parts of the population in order to allow restaurants, airlines, theatres, museums to reopen 100%, the earliest that we can ever get in, back to something which you could call normal, like it was in January of this year, the earliest will probably be a year from now. So this is not a short term problem. There will be no going back to normal. Not only that, when we get back out to a situation where we can reopen our buildings physically, the world will have changed. Uh, so even if we can open our doors again in September 2021, the world will not be exactly the same. The tastes and habits of consumers will have changed. Many people will be reluctant to go back physically to 600 people sitting in a room. Uh, people will have come to like digital entertainments and digital uh, and digital engagement. Uh, so in the light of this very painful process we're going through, there are two obvious reactions. Number one, which is very human and very understandable in the short term, is that you simply close in on yourself. You try to protect what you have. You try to hold on to as much as you possibly can, your people, your mission, your buildings, and you try and retain those to, to protect those as much as you can. Very human, very understandable. But the alternative, uh, which I think we're now facing, is that given that this is such a huge and long-term shock to the system, not just for the cultural sector, but including the cultural sector, we have to think very fundamentally about what we actually do. And that's the premise for this whole series. We know that only government funding can help keep the lights on in the short term. There is no other source of funding that will allow us to keep our buildings open and some of our people employed. But beyond that, the government will not be able to tell us how to reorganize ourselves for the longer term. Uh, and this has actually thrown a, a spotlight on some on many issues which were already there. The cultural sector in general is well behind in the digital economy, well behind, and could have done something about this years ago. Now it must start. Uh, the cultural sector we know has a, a mismatch between how the sector works, certainly in the Netherlands, and I know in other countries, and society. It's, it's behind on issues of diversity and inclusion, for example on other ways of engaging globally through digital media. Um, the cultural sector is very variable. Some people have been very creative in how they earn their money, but others not so creative. And it's clear that business models, actually how we generate our income and how we do our work must change. There is no choice. Uh, last week's seminar, the first one, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, our first seminar had Yasha Young from New York, uh, also worked in Berlin, also worked everywhere. She's one of those international people. Uh, and Leonard Buchenio, who's an, uh, uh, from Amsterdam uh, and an expert in transformation of company business. And they uh, introduced the, uh, us to some questions of existential questions, I can call them. The title of the session was uh, uh, Back to the DNA. And we were inviting everybody in the sector to ask some very fundamental questions about what we do and who we do it for. This session and the next session, Seminar 3, will be rather more about how we do it. Once we've established what's the really important part of what we do, how will we do it? And today we're asking questions about how can we turn our, turn our dreams into a reality? How can we make changes to our organizations without tearing them apart? Because change actually can simply add to the stresses we're already facing. Well, how do we do that? And really, who loves and needs us? Who are our people? Who are our community? Who are our donors? Who are our ticket buyers? Who are our physical community locally? All these questions. Who are we important to? There are no ready-made solutions. Every organization is different. Every context is different. So if you've plugged in today, 
expecting that you will have, take away notes and you will be able to change your organizations. That's not how it's going to work. Uh, we've invited people from different parts of the world and different sectors to ask, ask about how, uh, what are the processes we can go through? What are the thought patterns that we can go through in order to, um, in order to begin to make changes to our own organizations? And they'll also be providing some interesting examples which may be directly relevant to what you do. A couple of um, practical notes on the seminar. Firstly, we are recording, uh, but we will not be showing physically the faces of all our attenders. I'm sorry about that. It seemed to be too many screens uh, in front of us at one time. Um, when you want to ask a question in the question and answer session, then you will be able to raise your hand virtually using the Zoom facilities. I will see that and I will choose questions to, to answer and I will then unmute the microphone of the people who want to speak. So we will hear the voices of all the phantom people who are currently watching us. Um, the, um, the, the, the whole series is entitled Beyond Survival because really that's the topic. Uh, there are quite a few online seminars at the moment in the Netherlands at least about how we get through the current crisis, what we can do about how government funding is important, how we can protect our workforce, all very important questions. But in a sense, they're quite short term. What we're looking at now is beyond survival. Let's imagine those organizations will get to the end of this, they open their doors, well, what are they doing and how are they doing it? So beyond survival. Uh, and the whole seminar series, 12 speakers uh, are picked precisely because they are from outside the bubble of the Dutch cultural sector. That was entirely deliberate, which is not to say that people from within the Dutch cultural sector do not have uh, important things to say. In fact, they will be the people who will be transforming the sector and transforming their organizations. We want to contribute thoughts and examples from other parts of the world from different kinds of people. Today, we've invited Lea Stultrager, and uh, Lea has worked on the intersection of technology and the cultural sector for many years. Originally from New York, uh, but resident, I think, for about 10 years in Berlin. Uh, and she's created uh, a, a cultural organizations, a cultural organization in Berlin called The Y. Very interesting if you go and look at the website. Uh, career highlights include, I'm going to read this because it's so long, I mean, really. And I'm not going to read all of them because that would be longer than the seminar. Uh, the Lincoln Center, Coachella e Halle, uh, Contemporary Istanbul, Ciclo uh, de Bellas Artes, which I presume is the one in Madrid, the Hermitage Museum, St. Petersburg, and so on and so forth. She serves on the board as a board member of TEDx in Berlin. Uh, she often advises countries on innovation and urban planning and has been retained by VC firms for insight in investing and placement of emerging creative technologies. Uh, Kate Rolf is joining us from London. And Kate uh, set up the Rebels office. Uh, that's a great name. I imagine it's just party party all the time in the Rebels office. Um, and it's a commercial and audience development consultancy. Uh, really, the intention is to help arts organizations to uh, develop new revenues and new audiences. Uh, she's held management roles in commercial departments at some major UK cultural institutions uh, and has worked also internationally. So from Berlin and from London today, welcome to the seminar. Uh, and I think now I've forgotten, Kate, did we say you're going to speak first? Excellent, that's good. So what we're going to do is speak, Kate and Leah will each speak for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I know Kate has a couple of slides to share with us. Uh, I'll make an introduction to Leah in between the two very quickly and pick up a few points. And then uh, much of the rest of the session will be question and answer. And we want to hear from everybody here uh, their comments, their questions, their criticisms, but also maybe some examples of what they're doing in their own uh, environment. So Kate, uh, please take it away. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David, and for everyone for joining us today. Um, it's a particular pleasure of mine being able to do this with a Dutch-based company because uh, I absolutely love the Netherlands. So I spend as much of my spare time there as I can normally. Um, and I studied for a while at Leiden. So um, yeah, it's really lovely to be involved in this today. Um, so what I'm just first of all gonna do is just get the technology sorted. Let's share my screen with you and let's get this slideshow up and running. So yes, here we are. Um, 
what I thought I would speak to you about today is um, a new program that I've been running recently, which is specifically designed to help arts organisations to rethink how they traditionally have operated and to discover new value for the future. I call it Culture Sprint. So what is Culture Sprint? It is based on the tools of design thinking, which I use a lot in my own consultancy work. Um, and the basic principle is to deconstruct challenges, work collaboratively across teams and expertise to explore solutions, and then rebuild into an action plan that you can then test and learn from. An important principle is to keep questioning why things are as they are and why you're making the decisions that you do. Um, and interestingly, I, David, you just used reference to dreams. Another, some big things with design thinking is being really optimistic and letting yourself dream and not being hampered by um, any problems and, and sort of a brutal reality. It, it is designed as a moment to think abstractly and to go big and then come back from there. So to start with, um, I always encourage everybody to do the golden circle exercise for their businesses. So some of you might be familiar with this. Um, there is a TED talk that I will send a link around for, but it was an idea developed by Simon Sinek and it um, is designed to put, put simply, it is about framing why you exist as an organization. So why? It's not about what you offer, or how you do what you do, but why? And the theory is that that is what audiences care about. So for example, if I offer my own why for my own organization, I do what I do because I believe that arts and heritage organizations already have the power in them to be some of the most effective and impactful organizations in the world. But we need to allow ourselves to change and we need to change more often and we need to be able to change quicker. So as a sector, I believe we're incredibly innovative and we're, and we're very resourceful, um, but I would argue that perhaps we are a little set in our ways and that we could do with some fresh thinking and definitely a move to more collaborative working. And that's collaboration with our teams and with partners and also with our audiences. And this is what Culture Sprint is all about. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to explain a little about a couple of the workshops that I've been running really recently. So one was yesterday and one was two weeks ago um, and they're with arts leaders in the UK. So it's, it's very much a UK perspective, but um, I feel the content is very relevant. So what we did in the first session was we, was, we were looking at audiences. So what we did was um, I asked everybody to map out any audience that they could think of. And I asked them to put them on this diagram based on their size. So that was their physical size. And depending on how close they are to the organization shows um, their sort of both physical closeness and, and any emotional closeness. Um, so for example, to kind of explain, we've got it here down by our little museum, staff and artists. Those are quite small groups, but they're very close to the organization. Whereas we have young people right at the top there in red and that's deemed to be a huge audience but very distant from a lot of organizations. Um, one observation that I thought was very interesting when I did this exercise and um, to give them credit we did this exercise in about two hours and it was the first time anyone had done it but um, all of the audiences are the audiences that you would expect. Um, it's school groups, it's corporates, it's young people, there was no real look at audiences that we don't currently have. There was a little bit, but this was something I thought was missing and I will come back to you shortly. So the next move was to take all of those audiences and remap them to look at value. Uh, so of course, this is very subjective um, because the value might be financial, social, artistic. It could be about reputation or your brand. But what we ask people to do is have a go. So just try and define the value. Uh, so for example, you've got down in a dark green uh, staff. So we felt that they were very high value. Previous clients are deemed very high value. Whereas uh, we have under fives there in the middle. Under fives, we said they're low value. The under fives are not big spenders. Let's give them a light green. And then the last step. So we moved all of the higher value audiences close to the museum. 
And if we're being very brutal, this is a sensible business decision is you should move the people that offer the higher value closer to you. And also equally, those are the people that you offer the highest value to. So you'll see now that technically under fives here at the top in the light green, technically we should just not engage with those groups. So bye bye under fives, we're not going to look after you. Now, of course, that's not quite right in reality. And also this diagram demonstrates the huge range of audiences uh, that arts organisations are trying to engage with. So um, an important step here is to sense check. And really, this is where feelings come in. So we do ask participants, if, how do you feel about this? Does it not feel right? Or is there some extra information you know that might change things? So in fact, do our lovely under five audiences actually come with their very high value parents? Um, or is there a potential deal that you might be doing with a, a kid's broadcaster that would mean under fives are actually very valuable? Or perhaps your core purpose is education for young people, in which case the under fives would be a much higher value. So it's really important to, to rethink your diagram and it is purely an exercise. But the important thing is to use facts to use empathy and a little bit of gut instinct in order to reorder these audiences to help you prioritize. But what is key is throughout is to keep questioning your assumptions and make sure that your assumptions are not based on an old reality. So today is all about um, new ways of delivering your mission and, and actual practical outcomes of what's next. So I want to, to think about that a little bit and what these audience insights might tell us. So for example, we, we know from this exercise that say corporates are high value clients. We have a lot of corporates booking venue hire, perhaps involved in sponsorship. So it would make sense to think that there might be other corporate individuals that offer high value, perhaps those that are not connected to events or to sponsorship. And if you have a look at what's available to you, so that might be your building, your collection, your team, what can you offer that audience? And critically, what problems do they currently have that you might solve? So I'm just going to quickly whiz through a few examples here. So we have a, a lovely picture of the art gallery tour group. Galleries are quiet, reflective spaces, and a lot can be learned from them about mindfulness and well-being, perhaps disconnecting from technology and thinking creatively. And big business spends big money on well-being for their employees and ways to help them innovate and balance their work. So why don't you help them meet that need? So we know that there is an audience there and we know that they are high value and you're sitting on assets that are valuable to them. So why don't you make that more accessible for them? If we look at the film set example that we have here, filming is obviously a quite an established part of a business model for a lot of arts venues now. We know that there are filming clients, we know that they are high value, so how can we reach them more? And this has been particularly interesting, I think, uh, given the pandemic, because the film industry have been one of the ones that have bounced back in a big way. They have the resources available to them to be able to put loads of protection, uh, COVID protection in place. Uh, there's a high demand for new content because everybody's watched everything on Netflix now and filming is back up and running. Um, Interestingly, events, a lot of events have essentially become broadcasts where they need interesting backdrops in order to have digital events. Um, so essentially venues are going to become the studios for those broadcast events. So here we see an opportunity to hugely scale up an existing market uh, if we can make working with them more attractive. And my point here is that although a lot of um, arts organisations are doing very well in, in welcoming filming in, there's a lot of hesitation about the safety of that, the impact on the collection, the impact on any daytime audiences. And I think this is the point about hard decisions, is if you're in a really difficult financial situation and the market is there and you have something to offer them, this is the time when I think we need to start questioning that and making it more possible to engage with those very high value markets. So lastly, this top um, example here is thinking about public audiences. So we've seen that every arts organisation would always say that the general public, families, workers are very important to them. 
And I love this example, uh, which is based uh, from the Netherlands-based Northern Light and the Trof Museum, the, the National Museum of World Cultures in the Netherlands. They knew where their audience was. Their audience was at train stations all across the country, commuting to work and going out on days out with their families. They also had a collection that was in stores that no one ever got to see. And so they took that step that so often is not taken of taking their collection out to their audiences and making these mini museums on train stations. And the impact was huge. And I was so inspired by this from an audience engagement perspective. But with my commercial hat on, there's so many more ways that you could take an opportunity like that to generate revenue, to build trust and to have that long term relationship with audiences. So these are just a few ways that I've seen that through understanding audiences and really considering the assets that you might have to offer them, you can start building new value. So we've looked outside, we've looked at audiences, we've looked at partnerships, but what about inside? I feel passionately that teams are underutilized in our sector and this by no means that they are underworked because we all know how hard cultural sector employees work and it is often very small teams achieving an awful lot. But there is value in your teams that can be released. So I did uh, my next exercise of culture sprint was specifically at teams. And we did an exercise um, looking at metaphors that might explain how arts organisations are modelled and how they work and how they're structured. And we asked the participants to have a think of any metaphors uh, in the natural world or in their past times that might uh, explain this. So, for example, one person said that they felt like they were swimming alone across the channel. I asked them if they ever had a support boat and they sometimes said there was a support boat but often it was just them alone. And that's a really tough way to work. So another person said that they felt like they were a flotilla or part of a flotilla, um, dr drifting across the seas according to the winds with different teams out at front, simply depending on the weather. Um, we have to admit that's not very strategic, uh, although it's a lovely image. Uh, so definitely some improvement there. And of course, what we really want is a very well coordinated, highly trained rowing team where you have one person at the front clearly ordering um, instruction that everybody understands and everybody knows their role. So a lot of the discussion that we had in this particular session was about remodeling teams and how to approach the reality that we will face in terms of redundancies. And my key points here are these. So number one, what are the skills and knowledge that individual team members have in your organization that you could utilize better? So don't remodel based only on their job titles. Think about their skills. Number two, where could you save time such as reducing meetings or admin, or perhaps even bringing two teams together that talk to the same audience in order to get greater value overall from the people that you have in place? And number three, have you fully listened to your teams and empowered them to achieve what you hired them to do? So this is about taking a step back and thinking, is there anything that you can do to change how you work or how the organisation is structured that would let people be more effective and give back that much needed return? So what is key in the cultural sprint process really is listening to teams that you might not usually work with having empathy with them and sharing insights. And my feeling is that generally due to the um, very mixed expertise that you have in arts organisations and the high demands on them, that we often end up very siloed and that it is actually collaboration and transparency that is going to help arts organisation weather this storm and come out all the better. So a final thought here is um, on why we should do this. Uh, so why should we bother changing our teams and our audiences and spending time searching for new ways to engage them? And I was struck by an article that I read in Vogue um, in September, which was entitled How to Fix Fashion by Dana Thomas. And it was reflecting on the challenges that the, the fashion industry has faced over the past century. And she covered everything from world wars and the financial crises and, of course, the pandemic. Um, right there, working conditions, sustainable fashion, and of course, Black Lives Matter. 
And what struck me for this article was that she had pinpointed that there were various practices that are inherent to the fashion industry that are really counterproductive. They're counterproductive to them as a business and to modern sensibilities about consumerism. So things like Black Friday um, emerge simply as a quick fix from the 2008 financial crisis. And just since then, no one had bothered to question it and it got worse and worse and worse. And it wasn't until the pandemic that everyone stopped and reflected and said, this is broken and we have time to fix it and, we, it, and it's okay to change. So in regards to our own sector, as we recover, what I'm keen to see is that we recover to something new. Um, new, refreshed, energised, and, and energised for our audiences and for our teams. So this is not about recovering to where we were before. It's about addressing some long-standing challenges that we've had to come back to a place where we are more resilient and more exciting. And what's key to this is letting ourselves rethink, letting ourselves listen to each other and our audiences, allowing time for testing, allowing time to fail, and then exploring this together so that we can all do what we do best even better. So if you're not moving forward, you might already be behind, is the sentiment, to gear you on to make changes. Okay, thanks very much, Kate. Um, <clears throat> we'll move straight on to Leah's contribution, and then we'll open it up to everybody participating. A couple of things I picked up on is that uh, actually right now, I mean, perhaps more than ever, uh, it's a question of deconstructing what we do and why we do it, what's our mission, and also who we do it for. So identifying that very clearly, because that will then lead to uh, necessary organizational changes, changes to our business planning. Uh, the idea that this must be collaborative inside the organization, but also collaborative with the people for whom we are important. Audiences, yes, but also more generally our communities. Um, but that in the end, you have to have a very concrete action plan. And indeed, that's what this session and the next session are about, is turning some of these thoughts into real action. Um, there may be a need for identifying skills within your organization, including potentially realizing that we don't have all the skills we need inside our organization for what, a, what is now a changing world. So thanks for that. Um, and moving on now to uh, Leia. Uh, and Leia, do you want to share your insights with us, please? Thank you for hosting this and thank you for having me. Um, I think it's important for me to start very quickly by saying how I got to Berlin. Um, after listening to that talk, I'd just like to say that how I got to Berlin was in 2009, 2008 and 2009, which Kate discussed, there was a huge financial collapse. And I was a gallery that did very well. Um, I was one of the first galleries in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and one of the bigger ones. I had even outside space. So in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that's kind of unheard of, and I had it. Um, but in 2008 and 2009, I was faced with the decision on what to do and how to grow, how to continue to be successful. And my decision was to downsize and to move to Berlin. I kept my New York gallery and I um, had what I thought was going to be a temporary project in Berlin using sort of the same budget, but reallocating it in a different way. And what I found was that in Berlin, I soared. My business went through the roof. I never expected that, but it was a time of change and a time of great fear, if I'm going to be quite honest, um, of, of those changes, of changing what I always did that had always suited me to something that opened up a whole new world and opportunities for me. And the second part of that, I, where I am going to start my conversation, is that I come from a sector of private art dealing and the business of art dealing and the business of art marketing and the business of business of the cultural business so that's where i'm going to approach this um my talk today i'm going to not tell you what to do not i mean no one can tell you those things no one can give you answers but what i can say is that i have three very important market trends that are emerging that will affect the cultural industry and it will affect us all. It doesn't matter if you're a music uh, producer 
or a fashionista or a writer or a museum or a gallerist. These are going to affect you because they're social cultural changes that were brought on by the pandemic. And the other thing I was going to say is that because of where I'm coming from, that I am from that business marketing side, um, I tend to talk about art, which I love, which is my passion, which is my hobby, and which is my life, also as a business. And I, I, in changing how I talked about it, and that's the first thing I'm going to say, in changing how I talked about art, when I used to say I'm a gallerist and I represent artists, it was a very small target audience. It was collectors, and it was people that were interested in visiting or viewing those sort of installations or those sort of art projects that I did. When I started talking and swinging it from being a gallery and um, having providing studio space for the artists and exhibitions to saying I'm having an event and we are an agency and I produce creative content, all of a sudden the world changed. And I was still doing the same art. I was doing it at a bigger scale with bigger budgets for more people. And it's really in learning how to speak the language to expand to those that are going to be important in the years to come because we can't continue to have the same audiences just like i couldn't in 2008 no matter how much it hurt me to move from new york i proved to myself which i didn't think was going to happen that it was a good move so without further ado i'm going to go into three different trends that i see and i'm going to really kind of get into detail with some examples and ways that it can be incorporated into a business plan proactively. Um, I think the, the big running theme for today is it's not a time to sit and, and hold tight for times that are not going to come back. Um, the challenge that we have to rise to is actually being better. It's not a challenge of trying to remain who we are. Um, the first thing that I see is a, a, a social cultural change completely is a movement from the um, fear of missing out experiences to embracing deeply personal experiences. And where I'm going to start with these trends is very broad. However, I'm going to get more detailed. And it's, I, I'm hoping I'm picking trends that nobody even would argue because this is a trend that you can see across, across the board. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's a rise of a superficial, there was, there was this rise of a superficial surface level engagement. Um, we have things like the Museum of Ice Cream. We, and yes, that's art and design, it's wonderful. But, you know, it is a superficial sort of experience. Or the challenges, the viral challenges, can you eat the cinnamon, can you um, dump the water, all of these things may be for good causes, but they're very superficial challenges, and that has actually winged very, very hard due to the cultural shifts, and the forced isolation by default has put an emphasis on introspection, and responsible actions. It's something Kate was talking briefly about at the end, you're seeing that. It's no longer about superficialness. It's no longer about um, grandiose uh, photos or, or uh, photos to prove you were there or photos to say, look at what I have. That is extremely inappropriate at this point. Um, as a social shift, that is dramatic. And most significantly, um, you can see that in people checking out, stepping back and going off the grid, they're no longer afraid of keeping up. That is a, a global shift in how people are thinking about their time. And um, it will the, the main takeaway from that for people having this isolation, this time out, is that it's not going to cause a personal implosion, uh, but it's gonna fuel isolation, stepping back, thinking for yourself in a different way, being forced to think in a different way, then just continue what's routine and what we feel is um, standard or the right way, being forced to think differently. It's not gonna cause an implosion. It's gonna fuel better focused ideas, more efficient work, more valued uh, expenditures of both time personally and professionally. Now, how does this actually fit into the market? You have the rise of things like the joy of missing out. 
it, which is as important right now, if not more important, and eclipsing the fear of missing out. And hopefully we're going to see that more and more. I'm, I'm excited by it. Um, you're going to see work environment, of course, you're going to see work environments going digital. Once inconceivable, now the proven business model is a game changer. You're going to uh, go for top-down budgets and an increasingly preferred means of employees to stay at home, to work from home, at least part-time. Um, you're also opening yourself to a workforce, which I find very exciting, that it, it's a work platform, a, a virtual work platform, at least partial, opens it up to equality in ways that our workforces never have been, whether that is um, to somebody who has autism, to a woman with a child, to people that are outside your locality. You're talking about equality um, that you should be embracing and that is exciting to see in the culture coming out of this. Uh, you have another example of this market trend, Netflix and chill. This is something Kate said. And I'm going to expound on that and saying that not only are people, um, you know, watching more online, but we have to ask why and, and what that's saying. There's been a groundbreaking year of award nominated programming before COVID, leading into before COVID. You still had these people that were choosing and not these people, you had a general population that was choosing to stay at home rather than go out to a sensory experience in a theater. They're choosing a private, quiet moment is finding that more meaningful. As cultural providers, we have to listen to that. That's extremely important. And lastly, in this in market trend, I have an example of the rise of social justice and um, social movements. And there's this idea of wokeness, um, which is a very, very tightrope walk. And you're seeing that do wonderful, um, amazing things to bring voices to be heard. I, you know, I am so proud of the fact that people are actually now being heard that have been fighting for decades, generations to be heard. I am not one of those people, but I am so happy to hear more and listen more. Um, the most important thing that we can say in that is that you can't, you can't take for granted that this movement is not yours or that movement is not yours, but that they matter. And you're seeing that have pluses and minuses. And a minus, I'll say, for something to learn from was the Philip Gustin exhibit that was just canceled. Because the way that people marketed and talked about Philip Gustin, and I love Philip Gustin, if it was discussed in a way that actually was relevant to today and to what is happening now, the Philip Gustin exhibit would not have needed to be canceled. The fact that they did not um, hear and listen to what audiences were saying going into that led to a problem with Philip Gustin of all people. Um, the learnings from this, the cultural shift in what people are engaging and how people are engaging, they're looking for personal journeys. They're not looking for public displays. They're looking for it to be meaningful to them, for their actions to matter. There's a market shift in people and how they will spend their leisure time and their leisure money. That will not go back to normal. It will not go back to the normal that we knew two years ago. It's not going to. Um, there's a different public perspective on what is tolerable, what people are in, uh, what people are willing to think of as a cultural and um, social context and responsibility and programming. All of that is being considered in a very new light, and I welcome it because to get audiences that want to think and want to engage on a deeper level and not that superficial level is a welcome change for me from you know for me i'm happy to see that and lastly for this how can we actually get this into a business plan like what does it mean to cultural institutions here's some examples um inclusion awareness and commitment actions not superficial um programming that is of 
a, a personal nature. You see more uh, artists in residence programs. Uh, you see and fabulous things like David Byrne and sing-alongs, open sing-alongs. You see co-creating outlets. You see very different means of people from all over that are not particularly artistically inclined to become engaged and feel that they matter. And because of that, because of them being part of what is going on, they actually want to stay and see it grow and they have a vested interest in it. That is the positioning from the, from the cultural business that I would take. Um, online art experiences that are meaningful, you cannot just have your website and your social media, I'm gonna go into that in a moment, or even just a streamed event. Those are not, they're very great starts, but they're not where you need to be to have that online be a revenue and an asset to your business. Um, last but not least, the ch uh, ticketing. One thing that people are doing that is really smart is they're ticketing to limited edition runs or mobile um, immersive happenings that are extremely innovative. And there's a physical presence um, that's built in the very art. In, uh, it's built into the art in a function. For example, Super Blue. And if you guys are familiar with Payson and others are doing these new initiatives where it's short run projects, a high ticket sale, and it's meaningful for the person to be there physically because the art responds to them and they can feel it, it matters. Their presence is actually creating that art. And it's a very good response to this. Um, the second big trend that I see is that there's quality swinging back from, and this is something David um, was mentioning a little bit in previous conversations, quality swinging back, um, I'm sorry, quantity, leaving the stage and there being a shift or a swing back to quality and scale transitioning to scope. We had been going in as a global cultural world, doesn't matter, uh, I have like examples that I'm gonna get to in a moment from all over the world. It got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we got to the point where we were looking at 50,000 square foot spaces, malls being converted by artist groups, which is a wonderful thing. However, it's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable business plan. Um, the, other, the other kind of swing in that is so in per in a parallel to the fundamental shift in what people are valuing and how they're spending their time, there is an emerging trend in rebutting that sense of expenditure, that sense of uh, putting that value or that budget towards scale and not towards scope and not towards quality. Um, that, you know, it's it's a, a thing that to me is almost uh, too late to happen because I really feel very badly for a lot of the projects that really took advantage of amazing opportunities to grow very quickly, very, very quickly without a long-term vision of sustainability and stability, without it be dependent on things that they thought were always going to be there. And that's not, that's not a good business plan. Um, so on that, I'm gonna give you some examples. Now you're seeing things of this trend, such as tiny homes. You're seeing exodus from cities to suburbs. You're seeing uh, countries that um, are really, quite honestly, having mass changes of their inner cities. And you're having the nomad movement. You're having things such as Marie Kondo telling you, keep what you love, all else can go. You have mega, mega co-working spaces publicly collapsing on such a scale that they're making headlines for being disasters, for being too big and too overvalued too quickly. Not that they deserve it. I, I really feel that they had good places in their heart, but that's the reality of, um, of not understanding a market and that it has trends and thinking things will always be there. Um, you have, for example, you have not only the mega immersion spaces and 
the um, co mega co-working spaces, you also have actual commercial property dropping. So you are in a position where you have people that are having hard times to pay rent, where the rents are actually lower right now if they were to renegotiate or find a different space. And that's really interesting to me. Um, and you also to have the online versus storming and you have that's kind of the last nail in our commercial commerce you see people that are really doing commercialism in a different way and changing how they're working with creatives and for example you have this is kind of an older example but red bull and red bull music academy brilliant solution you have Karstadt, which is one of the big mega department stores in Germany, doing a full um, circular economy used clothing project with artists. You have and throughout the whole store, you have experienced brand marketing by Levi's and Nike's, where they're using artists to create immersive um, physicality spaces, where it's about customizing your jeans or customizing or getting your your special shoes that are one of a kind the learnings from this as cultural institutions we can't wait for 2019 return we already said that like i think that's agreed on the people that have talked thus far but um the other thing is that it's really i'm trying to drill in that it's changing the market and it's changing specifically physical space and how that's going to be a, a venue or a vehicle for um, revenue. It's really, really changing that. And especially for the bigger venues. And that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, it just means you have to think about it differently, in my opinion. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is that circular economy, which is also something that Kate looked in, uh, Kate kind of touched into, is a big trend coming out of this going into business plan, being responsible for your production, for your reuse, for who you are partnering with, for example. Um, it is a very deep rooted way to actually take these learnings and make them a positive way of your business plan. And not just for now, but for years to come. Um, shared examples, specific examples, shared gallery spaces, meaning of and shared merging of cultural projects. Um, you have Gavin Brown and Barbara Gladstone. You have Billboard and Rolling Stone merging this month. You have um, gallery shares, repurposing of space for identified art and local community needs, um, such as PS1's music, which has been around for a while, but that was really revolutionary and I, I, I still see its importance today. Um, again, uh, one that's a few years old, but revolutionary, New Inc., which is the new, museum, uh, new Museum's Accelerator Program for creative technology, artists that are working in new ways, an actual accelerator program. You have another great example of thinking outside the box on use of space, uh, the Whitney's Curator Program or Christie's Master's Program. You have all of these different ways of looking at space and reallocating it into a different revenue stream. Um, the last thing is that people are not just putting on hold their plans, they're having to cancel them and restructure physically, including downsizing their workforce. And that is a reality that is very, um, very real and needs to be built into a business plan. Uh, examples of that, you have South by Southwest, Meow Wolf, Burning Man. Burning Man went virtual this year. I guarantee the stock of that was minuscule. And not only that, but you're looking at um, actually a revenue change to entire cities like South by Southwest revenue stream to Austin is incredible. And Burning Man to the Coachella Valley is incredible. How do we actually have a business plan moving forward that would not rely solely on a single event for the year? Um, and I, I think culture and cultural institutions, that's very relevant. A big one on this, smart networks. Um, right now you have companies, people, organizations across industries, across all industries, joining into these mini societies, self-governing alliances, and based on their sharing of how they're sharing data 
or their technology network, they're becoming actual, in many societies, I call them smart networks. The way that uh, we have that now, and that's a trend that's gone from social media, right? And that being owned as a platform that we share, you know, owned by a third party to owning our own networks, owning the way that we can actually monetize them and make them into businesses that's a respectful way, that's transparent, that has privacy. Um, ways that that specifically can be in, uh, kind of implemented into a business plan. Decentralization, you've got blockchain, you've got digital currency, um, long-term digital, uh, digitalization alliances, such as uh, looking at the tech as a medium and not as a tool, as a medium. So looking at partnering with the AR and VR, looking at partnering with the motion tracking, looking at partnering at these things that make it a better enjoyable experience for your, your visitors, but also bring in a way for virtual visitors to come in. And lastly, give you insights that you wouldn't otherwise have, which brings me to the last bit of my conversation today. And that is the localization and de uh, localization and diversification, the biggest one on the list. Um, tourism, there's a paradigm shift. And it's not just about the restrictions of the temporary. It's about a near time and a near time stability in planning leisure travel or travel alone for people that um, would generally be those that would go to a place for culture. And there's just not, it's not just about the boundaries, but the security and longer term planning and that in finances that people are not, are not making those trips and not are, are not going to be making those trips in any near time soon, not even with border uh, restrictions lifted. There's not the stability there. Um, th there's not the, the faith, actually. Uh, reality, uh, the reality of the lack of tourism will create, this is an important one, a need for localization. What does that mean? That means you need to look at those numbers Kate was talking about of who your clients were, who, who was your audience. If you had a large international audience, you're going to have to look at how to make that localization move fairly quickly because you're looking at, I think, David, you said one year, I would say probably a year and a half to two of localization being a main part. Um, and that's from A to Z so that the place that you're physically in, finding ways to engage that community, um, requiring a shift to relying from a traditional culture venue or revenue, traditional revenue venue, revenue streams um, to a set of streams that's not uh, traditional venue streams, just not. Um, I talk about smart networks, but examples of this trend, you have the Berlin Club Commission, um, which did, did United We Stream, which was an incredible, incredible case study. Uh, the basically, long story short, the clubs in Berlin all faced COVID. They couldn't open, and they got together and formed a, a very loosely fitting organization of local people in the same boat, in this experiencing the same things within. A month and a half, they had raised a million dollars and changed the amount that they were making as a group of clubs entirely to digital streaming from not having that even be a consideration in the months prior. Um, last I checked, they had over 4 million streams, and that was some time ago. Um, all hats off to them, grassroots localization, great example. You have uh, OnlyFans is a great example of this. You have Masterclass, which is a great example of this. Masterclass, you have, for example, people like um, David Sedaris teaching a class that I can go to for 10 euro, 15 euro. Bring it on, I'll go. Um, you have the best of the best that are looking at actually sharing their craftsmanship, their themselves actually their art themselves in a whole new personal way which gets back to that first uh, trend that i was talking about and the last two i'm going to say which were really kind of funny examples but very telling and very very important to look as case studies 
was the Cowboy Museum. If you guys didn't see what happened there, but when they went into COVID, no one was in the museum and they only had a security guard. So the security guard became the Twitter person and their Twitter numbers became through the roof because it wasn't, I'm gonna post you know, this painting and talk about it. It was somebody talking about their personal findings along the way, funny, um, sometimes completely wrong. People corrected him, people wanted to talk to him about it and teach him about it. And another one that's along that same line is in Philadelphia, they have um, a pretty scrappy, Philadelphia is a poor city. And your sports are related to how much taxes you have and Philly's poor. And I'm a Philly girl, I'm born in Philly, raised in New York, but born in Philly. And they had a uh, mascot for one of their teams that's called Gritty. And Gritty was just like this monster. He doesn't even have a shape. His social media is historical and he won all the web awards last year all of them so you're talking about a sports franchise winning you know technology awards like the webby awards and the what that did to driving business and driving people to watch online to buy those tickets and fill that stadium to buy the merchandise and to be on the same team as that mascot as that character as that persona uh, you could not buy better um, so the learnings from that are to embrace reinvention, get to know the digitalization components so that you understand not just how to use them, but how they can be built. I, I know everybody's going to hate me when I say this, and I'm telling you, I can do it myself, but I have to do it, and we all do. You need to know the back end as well as the front end. Um, for example, Avada, it's no longer, you need to know how that website works, how to build it, how it's an aim how it actually functions. If you don't, you need somebody on your team to have in that meeting to explain it. Um, to Hootsuite, to knowing not only how to use it, but how it works, how to leverage it. Yoast, for example, for social media, animated GIFs, you know, to innovations such as geocaching, uh, QR codes, motion tracking, 360 video, AR, VR, all of these things. Um, you really, not that you need to be an expert in it, but you need to know the back end to really understand what they can do for you. Um, lastly, in this trend, the big important one is to understand your big data. And what I mean by that is that that is the biggest insights that you can get. It's not about your numbers and what people are telling you at, when they fill out their little questionnaires or um, you know what their comments are. It is actually that big data. And what I mean by that is knowing um, uh, what people are clicking on, what they're, where they're coming to your site from, what pages they're looking at, how long they're staying, what they're not looking at, what they're not interested in, in finding out more about. And really looking at that and having real conversations with the big data team, the business intelligence teams, and the curatorial planning team, the business development team, the community outreach team, so that everybody is understanding what that audience is saying to you. It's our time to listen. And that doesn't mean that we change our curation style, but it means we have a better informed understanding of how we need to talk, the words we need to use, and to un understand how to reach that audience. Um, that's really the key to the modern world. So I'm going to sum up if I have one more minute. Not David, do I have one minute? Okay. One minute? Okay. So long story short, all of this change is really not a fun thing. It's not happy times. It's not, it's scary times. It's fearful times, but it can also be exciting. And the pitfalls watch out for and i kind of want to bring we can talk about all the great things i want to bring up the pitfalls change fatigue too much too fast you need to priority to prioritize do not go big learn from the problems of the past um dictating versus leading think hard and deep and not just about your words but your actions they need to be um inspiring but and not divisive include the different people on your team than you normally would especially younger especially people that aren't coming from the same background as you it's extremely important and communication versus engagement they are not the same thing 
so with that, I'm going to kind of turn it back to David. In summary, these are the things I'm seeing. These are the ways that I'm seeing examples and really solid, great moves in business plans. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks very much. Um, there's, a, there's too much there for me to try and summarize, and you also <laughs> summary at the end. I mean, one thing that's coming through clearly, which I think everybody knows now, is that there is a profound change in the importance of physical location, profoundly. And that goes back to, I mean, the cultural sector generally, uh, the way they have engaged, the way they have uh, done their business of bringing art, of whatever kind, to the public, the way they've earned money is about one physical location at one time. Basically, that's it. It may be repeated on a few days, even for longer than that, but fundamentally, come here one time. Uh, Leia, we've lost you. Has your light gone out? I think her video has gone off. Anyway, we hope she comes back. Um, so the, the importance of physical location will change dramatically. That doesn't mean that a physical location is not important in the future, uh, but that actually the way that people engage may no longer be uh, exclusively or even mainly through a physical location at one specific time. Um, the, um, and this goes to your employees as well. Um, city centres will change dramatically. And that will have a knock-on effect, for example, on business models, models relating to restaurants and cafes, which are run by cultural organisations. It has a, a change on where you expect your staff to be at any one time, and who can be a staff member. Um, so uh, th this is an it will change the relationship between producers and venues quite dramatically. Uh, so these are kind of things that we will have to look at. And uh, Leah and Kate have both said that they do not have the solution for your organization. Uh, but one thing I think it is pretty clear is that the changes that are coming upon us means that any solution for any organization is not going to be found exclusively within that organization. Uh, and organizations must indeed be much more collaborative with each other, much more humble in expecting advice, in looking for advice and expertise from outside the sector, and also much more humble in engaging with the people uh, in their communities, with artists, uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, with the people who will, they hope will provide their revenue in the future. Okay, I'm gonna stop there uh, because we have half an hour now when I hope we can have questions and comments and criticisms and personal experiences from uh, people who are attending. You can raise your hand and then I will unmute your microphone and we can hear your lovely voice asking the question. We seem to have lost Leia, uh, so I hope that maybe maybe Berlin has ceased to exist in the meantime. But we seem to have lost Leia, so, but Kate and I will do what we can in the meantime. Anybody have a question? I can't see that. Uh, does that mean that the raising hands is not working or that nobody has questions? You can also use the Q&A button on the bottom and just type your question if there's any problem with this uh, raising hands. Uh, so Q&A, if anybody wants to raise a, a question, just type it in the Q&A. We seem to have a problem with the uh, raising hands function. Okay, well, I'm going to pile, oh, here we go, Arna. I'm going to allow you to talk. The presentations. Uh, if you can hear me. We can hear you now, Anna. Okay, great, thanks. Um, actually, I had a question for uh, Leah, but uh, maybe you two can also answer it. I think we have to. Um, it's, it's about the, the rise of platform economies like Amazon, Google, yeah. uh, that take over, uh, well, a large revenues, not only, but also uh, big uh, audiences. And um, how does that relate to the, the story of quantity versus quality? Um, 
Kate, do you have anything to say about that? Well, it's a really good point. And actually what immediately springs to mind is a conversation I, I had only yesterday with um, somebody who works at Google. And one of my personal bugbears, I suppose, about the relationship between Google and arts organisations is they do so much good at opening them up to a global audience and offering uh, online tours and definitely a value during the pandemic and the lockdown. But um, it has gone a long way to devaluing the experience that museums might offer on their own online. Um, and I think that there is a role that some of these larger organisations might now need to play where previously they were offering their platforms to scale up audiences. And now I feel that they need to go to that quality point that we were talking about. It now needs to be about getting the right audiences and it needs to be about perhaps circling right back and finding ways to signpost those online audiences to the organisations in terms of ticketing, e-commerce, um, social media, you know, big um, PR campaigns. And I think in a way that there's been this huge scale that those kind of organisations have supported on, but now is the time if they really care to actually go for that more personal relationship and to bear in mind that they might actually hold some of the solutions to helping arts organisations survive in a way that we just can't in the way that they can because of their scale. So that's my immediate thought on that. Um, I think that the, the that's, um, I mean, obviously when thinking about online platforms, you're thinking about the big boys and indeed they do have a huge control over large parts of the market. But at the same time, there are hundreds of thousands of niche players uh, and the niche players uh, do well uh, often precisely because they're offering a very particular experience for a very particular audience. And you would expect that many people, as well as subscribing, say, to Netflix or spending a lot of time on YouTube or buying on Amazon, also subscribe to some really specialist uh, uh, online programming uh, or maybe the online programming one particular uh, venue or product producer. Uh, and there are many online retailers who are very specific to people who like buying very strange, weird things that I'm not interested in at all, but they prosper because they understand their audience. So I think in looking at, uh, uh, at scale versus quality, I think you have to have a bit of both. Uh, and that again goes back to the question of what it is you're offering to whom. Um, the scale of big platforms like Amazon, like uh, Netflix, means that if you can get your material on there, you can reach very large audiences worldwide and can make far more money that way. But I imagine that all the people who do that also have their own niche platforms and niche relationship with their consumers. So I think it's not a question of either or. It isn't true that Amazon crowds everybody out the marketplace. It's just that they provide a large marketplace, which is very interesting. But people do sell directly to their own consumers as well. Um, that's something, Arna, you know that I'm thinking about at the moment in relation to digital recording of, um, of uh, live uh, live performance, so performing arts, live performance recorded and therefore distributed online. Um, and uh, I'm pretty convinced that the answer there lies in creating a very large platform to reach scale, but also in helping individual organizations, producers, venues, to make their own content for their own audiences. The two sit together, I think. Um, okay, any more questions? Martin has uh, raised something in the chat. Uh, Martin, do you want to te tell us this question, please? Martin, would you like to say that? If I can get him to work. Yeah. You can. You can read it. Okay. Your voice is so much better than mine. <laughs> um, so Martin is asking, what about the future role of the subsidizers, the public funders, who might be much more conservative than the enlightened cultural manager uh, who is trying to change his or her organization while the public funder is asking us to perform business as usual? What do we think about that, Kate? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting one. Um, and there was a project that I was working on during lockdown, in fact, in the UK, where we had um, four of the big cultural institutions and they were different art forms working together to figure out um, a sustainable way that they might digitalize their collection and then make that available to people on the high street. Um, and 
it, it's still ongoing. Um, we're trying to get it off the ground, get funding. Um, but what's interesting about that was that this, this point about uh, there being a mismatch between what the funders require and are offering money for and what the arts organisations need was um, misaligned. And the thought that I have on this was, um, well, there's two things. There was a process by which we went through where we created a value model for that concept that very much looked beyond um, what a traditional funder might require in terms of numbers um, and types of audience. That was acknowledged. But it then went further and looked at the impact on the local economy. It looked at social well-being. It looked at education. And that, that value model um, covering all of those different areas where this one artistic or social initiative might offer value suddenly meant that they would be able to open up a multitude of, of new funding options. And I suppose that leads me on to my second point, which is that if the funders haven't caught up yet, they will eventually. And in a way, um, my solution in the short term would be to sort of play their game, which sounds awful, but it's about finding what they do want and then trying to leverage that platform, scaling it up behind the scenes to, to achieve what you want to achieve. So, for example, I had an interesting conversation this morning, which was about the use of immersive experiences to reach um, different types of disabled audience. Um, and what we were discussing was that there is money available for supporting access, which is fabulous. And that's so important. But then what might an experience that is made for that audience look like if you could scale it up for your public audience? So it's I, I think it's about being clever with the funding, um, but also then trying to to move the conversation forward to look at other ways that that experience might offer value to the wider community. Um, I think uh, just to tell you that the, our fourth seminar uh, of the series, which is on November the 4th, is precisely about this question of the relationship between funders and the organisations they work with, specifically local government, which I regard as the most important funder, not necessarily in terms of finance, but in terms of how well they know their organisations and their communities. One thing that's clear is that changes that we're talking about are expensive. Uh, and cultural organisations don't have a great deal of spare capacity in terms of money sitting in the bank waiting to be invested in new activities. They also don't necessarily have a great deal of capacity in terms of people with particular skills in their organisations. So they will need a great deal of help in making changes, in investing in new ideas, and occasionally in investing in things and failing. Now, that's a model of investment. Uh, and that's not usual from public subsidies. They want to pay for a certain thing, uh, and then it's up to us to spend that money wisely. But I think that the role of government, particularly local government, as we'll address in seminar four, is going to have to change so that they will support their cultural organizations as they make change, and as they try new things out, and as they share information amongst each other locally, and ideally nationally and internationally. Uh, so do have a, I hope you can attend seminar four because precisely we're looking at the question of the relationship between funders and the cultural organizations. It will have to change. Everything else is changing, so that relationship will also have to change. Uh, there is also a big role uh, from the cultural sector in lobbying for a change in funding. At the moment, the main issues are, please, can we have money to keep, keep surviving, which is essential. Um, and uh, a move also to make sure that funding is not cut from cultural budgets because at a time when uh, budgets of national and particularly local government are under great stress there is a risk that some local government organizations will simply cut back on funding for the cultural sector that's a big risk and there is great lobbying going on about that but i think the nature of that funding does need to change the rfcar the amsterdam funds for culture in here in amsterdam excuse me Leo, you're back. Leo's back. We'll, we'll come to Leo in a second. Um, the the AIFK uh, funding body in Amsterdam has just recently ended its innovation funding uh, on the basis that they needed that money to support cultural organizations in the short term. So exactly at the moment, the cultural organizations need to innovate. That very useful and far-sighted fund in Amsterdam has been taken away because of money troubles. 
uh, and I, I would hope that the cultural, cultural sector itself would lobby against that, despite the fact that it will mean less money directly for the cultural sector, uh, for cultural institutions. Um, okay, so we, we've talked, uh, uh, Leo, we were just talking about the relationship between uh, subsidy, subsidy organizations, public funding organizations who may well be behind the curve uh, and behind the needs of the cultural sector. We've just finished talking about that. Um, any more questions that we can address now, particularly with layer presence? Anybody raising their hands? I presume this means that we have done such a great job of addressing all the needs. Um, I'm going to take uh, an opportunity of um, uh, asking a question to, uh, to Leia. And you've said that managers of any kind of cultural activity, they need to be understand how tech works. Now, here's a problem. Managers of cultural organizations tend to be people rather more like me than like Kate. Uh, that is, they tend to be older and they're, they're often white, although that's not exclusively the case these days, and not always men, so it's not entirely people like me. And I, I, I'm not bad with technology, but I'm not fantastic. So how does somebody like me, how does somebody who runs a cultural organization who isn't themselves a digital native, how do they get their organization themselves to really understand what tech can do for them and more or less how it works? Um, First of all, I'm going to start by saying that you have to. It's not a question of, you know, do you want to? It's, it's a job. It's a chore. And that's why I'm saying, like, believe me, the last thing I wanted to do is teach myself Avada. But I had to. And why I just got disconnected was because there's a fire down the street and we had to set up a hot spot. And because our internet and electricity was <laughs> shot out because there's a fire down the street. And luckily it's not bad, but it, you have to know these things. And why that's just a kind of an off the whim example of, of course, you know, shit happens right now. Um, but why I'm saying that is because we are in a technology age. No one is going to deny that we are increasingly and exponentially reliant on technology. And you never want to be at the mercy of it more than you absolutely have to be. And if you don't understand how it works, workarounds, how it, and by what I mean by how it works is not only how it was built and how it works in your system, but also how it works with things like data, with privacy, with transparency, with tracking, all of these things, because we are living in a generation where the digital self is as valuable as our physical self. Um, so where do you start? You start with things that aren't scary and that you would find fun in. I, you know, I mentioned masterclass. I think they're brilliant. Uh, have some fun and do an animated GIF. I, you know, it doesn't matter if it's your your dog like catching a bone. Just do it. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I don't have a dog, so, but I'm, I'm I'm sure I understand what you're trying to say. Um, one of the um, I, I like quotes. I had a great quote from Einstein last time, so I'm going to do a, another quote here, which is relevant. Um, uh, we, actually, this goes back to something that Leonard Bukenia said in the first seminar. He said that all the solutions that the cultural sector need already exist in other areas, in other countries, but actually particularly in other sectors. So it's not that the cultural sector needs to re-examine, reinvent the wheel, not at all. It's that they need to be looking around rather humbly and recognize that within the cultural sector, they do not have all the skills and all the answers that they need. And that a lot of the assumptions they've been making for many years that have worked very effectively, um, they, they, cannot, uh, they cannot be relied on to provide solutions. So look outside the sector. Uh, and the quote is here from William Gibson, which is the uh, uh, father, he's the father of cyberpunk. Um, and not a science fiction writer in a sense, because he always sets his novels in the near future and tries to examine how society will develop quite quickly. Uh, his quote is, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. 
And I think that's absolutely profound. So an awful lot of the things that we need to do in the sector are already being done elsewhere. So just look around. Uh, I see we have a hand raised here from uh, Haukie. So I'm going to uh, unmute you, Haukie. Can you uh, tell us your question? I think I clicked the wrong button. Try again, please. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you both for the talks. Uh, I was intrigued by uh, what Leia said about the physical space, and that is all is going to change how we use it uh, and uh, the need for it. But right at this point, I, I heard on the, on the BBC News yesterday that there's um, the big cinemas. Uh, one of the change of big cinemas is, is going broke now. Uh, because they don't release the, the new uh, James Bond film, right? Um, so, if you look at the cultural sector, what spaces are we going to need? Bigger ones or smaller ones? Because with the social distancing, you would say, okay, we could use the bigger spaces, right? Because we cannot have the amount of audience in our theatres that, that we used to have, and we need those those income, the income from the tickets. So why can't we use the mega cinemas for like a theater play? So I, I, how can you elaborate a little bit on, on that kind of thinking? Maya, would you like to start with that one? Sure. Um, I feel like I, I'm also listening for Kate. I, don't, I, I tend to be very loud and overpowering. So um, I, the first thing I will say is that the release of one movie being the save all, catch all of an entire like chain of com a company, a corporation, an, an conglomerate even is crazy. And that's actually the, what I'm talking about. That's the last nail in the coffin of an already outdated business plan. It's it's not something that was just one event. It was um, a continuum, and that was the last nail in the coffin. You're also seeing, seeing that very directly in the cultural industry. It's the reasoning behind these big galleries merging. Even the big ones are merging. Um, so the re I think what you're really talking about is repurposing space. And I talked about some examples that I think were really interesting about that. I think it's a brilliant idea. It's needed. You know, the, the, the thing is not to just knock down and rebuild. That's not the answer. It's to update what we're using the venues for. And the example that I gave was Karstadt. Karstadt's in Hermann Platz in Berlin. Oh, it's got to be 50,000 square feet, if not bigger. They actually were um, the, one of the largest department stores in all of Germany, I believe. They shut down because no one's shopping at malls like that. And it's not self-sustaining. And they're putting in as a, um, a project, which I think is actually really interesting, a circular economy where it's reused and resell of used goods. And to meet the needs of what is going on right now, that's an amazingly smart reaction. The last part of what I will say is that, David, you gave a quote. And that was that, you know, what the, the solutions are out there, right? And you're right, the solutions are out there, but they're actually not solutions yet, right? So there's all of these parts that can be used or applied. And what's so great about being in the cultural industry and why I chose this industry, why it's my heart, is because we see things creatively that don't, don't exist in their, their structure, but the elements of them are out there and then we can put them together as a vision. And that's where we have to rise to our purpose right now. Where can we do projects that are completely new and innovative? Social practice, you're gonna see a whole new level of social practice as a form of art. Um, you see, for example, Bergheim being used by um, the Boros collection. Very interesting sort of examples of what you're talking about, but they're, they're thinking outside the box. It's not exhibitions. It's immersive um, design. You know, uh, uh, one more, one more um, example, Walt Disney, even before COVID, 
Walt Disney, which is like smarter than anyone I know. They're, they're smart cookies as far as a corporation. And you watch their moves. They, when they open their latest big event, their latest big ride, it wasn't a ride. And that was before COVID. It was the Star Wars world. And it, it's a full on immersive, it, it is game and VR and, and AR and gamification. It is theater. So it's bringing in all that art and performance and writing and it's um, design. And you walk into the Star Wars world, you stay in the Star Wars world, you interact, you are a character, you interact with characters. That is a trend you're going to see more and more of. That is the answers to these. All of them are outside the box, meaningful, personal experiences. And if you want a recommendation on something to watch sci-fi, years and years, dead on. Kate, do you want to say anything to that point? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And and I think, but I think what's really interesting, if we take the cinema example, um, because there's so much, fa you know, fantastic examples of people taking ownership of each other's spaces, you know, particularly use of car parks for arts, um, arts activity. But I, I would always go back and question, where are those cinemas? So just because they're empty doesn't mean we have to fill them. But if they are in locations where you know that there'll be an audience or it's an audience that you really want to reach or that somebody that really deserves to engage with what you offer and has never been able to because it's too far away. If there's a reason, if the, if the audience is driving it, then I think that's the reason to take over that venue, but not just because it's empty. And I think going on further, I think it's also about not just looking at yourself. So if you're taking your content somewhere else, who else might want to go with you? So is there a retailer? Is there a you know food and drink provider? Is there some cool new tech company? Is there someone that can go with you that will share the risk but make it even more exciting for that audience? So that's, uh, you know, for me, again, it always comes back to trying to question why and is there an audience for what you're trying to do? I think that the, the key point is not that um, all our theatres must close and all our museums must go online. That isn't the point at all. It's that we are everybody, everybody, but including the cultural sector, will see a tremendous change in the way we think about physical space. Uh, and there are many things happening already. Uh, Kate has talked about the use of unusual spaces to keep performance going during the COVID crisis. And there was a lot of that before anyway, and I think that will continue. Uh, and that requires new collaboration with people who actually own and control other kinds of physical spaces. It's working the other way as well. I noticed that the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam is, uh, has opened up as a study center uh, because schools and universities have the same problem. They can't bring all those students together in a small space anymore. So the Concertgebouw during the day when, when there's no performance, they have a lot of space and a lot of seats. And so they can have quite a few students in there with their teachers in some kind of study and teaching scenario with social distancing. Now, that's fantastic. Why weren't they doing it before? And why should they stop when the crisis ends? Because that's a space that during the day is not very much used. Um, uh, and so collaboration both ways of using physical spaces for non-arts activities and then arts using non-arts venues for, for activities, that's gonna happen much more. And as Kate said, that requires new kinds of collaborations uh, with different kinds of organizations. Um, any more questions? We have six minutes, we don't have to use it. Leah, you're asking a question or saying something? I have a follow up. And when you were talking, I was thinking that like, it's kind of, um, it, it's circular, right? It is circular, circular, that when you're going out after different partnerships in industries that you're not familiar with, you are answering some of the questions of how do you understand technology? Well, you learn from, you know, you kind of absorb, it's osmosis, but even more so, um, the cultural industry is built like young collectors or like these programs to like nurture the next generation of patrons. And your next patrons aren't the, the art collectors. They're the digital people. They're the people that are out there that are going to be part of that digital future with you. And so bringing them on early on and showing that you are sort of growing something with them, it's getting them involved from that start. They're gonna be there with you for that journey. And so it's, it's bilateral, mutually 
building you an audience and building you those next collectors, those next patrons, because that's your next group. The young collectors are digital. Um, okay, I see no more questions, so I'm going to begin to wind up. Um, I mean, one thing that's come out today, and then indeed we'll, I think, go through all the seminars we're running, is that we don't have all the answers in our hands, not at all, in, in the cultural sector. We really don't. And so we'd better start talking to other people, people with an expertise in certain areas, people who have tried out different kinds of solutions to similar problems, but in a very different context. How did they do it? What can we learn from them? Uh, and in particular, I think we need to be very respectful of our communities, however you define them. Certainly our audiences, the people who buy tickets, uh, the people who engage with us online, uh, and our physical local communities. We need to be much more respectful and actually engage them in asking what do they need from us? How could we better deliver it? Uh, so there, is a, there has been a tendency, uh, I hope you all recognize it, that the people who run arts organizations regard themselves as the experts and the government indeed funds the people who run arts organizations as the experts and they then provide this wonderful art to the public and they hope that it's consumed and appreciated but fundamentally goes from top down that model i think will not survive the covid crisis and i think engagement in a humble way with other organizations other experts uh, people with expertise in other areas and with our communities is one of the things good things that will come out of this change.